thank you so much uh, for the invitation um, and the introduction. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you all virtually. Um, I'm actually physically in uh, Lyon still, uh, nearing the end of a uh, sabbatical uh, that was made possible thanks to H2O Lyon and uh, the Collegium um, here at the University of, uh, of Lyon. And um, I would like to uh, also extend my thanks to the whole H2O Lyon staff who helped organize not just this webinar, but so much. And then um, a big apology to Bernie for uh, how fast I have a habit of talking. I'll try to slow down, but I'm terrible. Um, so anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about today is a form of restoration uh, for trying to uh, bring back healthier riverscapes. And um, what I want to uh, really emphasize is that uh, this is process-based restoration, and it's really about letting riverscapes um, do the work. So the purpose is to share a perspective on ways that we might reimagine uh, some of our rivers and streams as uh, something bigger, as, as healthy riverscapes. And uh, hopefully, in, in sharing that perspective, maybe there's some, some ways of explaining things that you might find helpful um, in communicating with the audiences and the groups that you work with. Um, and the experience I'll be drawing on is primarily uh, from uh, US, uh, and it's on one way that we can achieve healthier riverscapes. It's by no means uh, the only way. And this particular uh, method uh, is about leveraging natural processes and, and specifically trying to use low-tech structures to help us do uh, sort of some of the initial kickstarting uh, of, of, of that. I, do have a tendency to uh, <laughs> probably fire hose too much information. So apologies in advance. Um, don't feel like you have to uh, digest all of it. I'll try and slow down on the most important points. And then uh, if you're interested in any of it, we have a website that has uh, most of what I'll be covering here um, is there free for you to download. There's also self uh, self-guided modules. Uh, a manual, et cetera. So um, I will put up at the end a link uh, to, the, uh, to the slides and uh, those will also be available uh, via uh, the H2O Leon site. So in terms of our agenda, what I'd like to do is uh, start by uh, elaborating on what we mean by riverscapes and um, something we're all well aware of just how, how depressing the overall scope of their degradation is. And then um, I'll offer some principles of riverscape health that we've found helpful for sort of distilling a lot of science and different ways of saying things into some pretty basic concepts that help us understand um, what current conditions are and look at what recovery potential might be. I think in general, we tend to under, undersell what's possible in a lot of our riverscapes. Uh, we'll talk about low tech and a few examples. Uh, we'll highlight the key processes uh, that we need to be thinking about restoring or you know, more aptly getting out of the way of. And, uh, and then we'll conclude with some, uh, some principles, not on healthy riverscapes, but on sort of putting our restoration actions in context. And so that'll be uh, our sort of agenda. And as was mentioned, you can put your questions uh, in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, so first off, what's a riverscape? Well, it's a made up word. It's been uh, with us since at least the 1940s. Uh, obviously just juxtapose river and scape, you know, hints of a landscape, hints of a river. So even if uh, no one's seen it before, uh, they can usually sort of infer its meaning, but let's go a little deeper. Um, a riverscape, you know, clearly must include the channels, right? Um, this is uh, this is pretty obvious. It's going to be the aquatic habitat, uh, whole uh, the the riverscapes, if you will. That's the whole drainage network of of these. Uh, but uh, the channels uh, themselves are are not enough. A riverscape is more than just the channels. Um, it's also more than just the remnant corridor of riparian and wetlands that still remain along its edges. Uh, these broader uh, floodplains, even if they're not currently flooding, they're not actively flooding, uh, they could. And this brings us to a definition, which uh, we've, uh, we find helpful 
which is really equating these riverscapes um, locally with the valley bottom. And if you've just arrived, um, make sure to mute yourself. Um, the, our definition here is a riverscape is the part of the landscape that could plausibly flood by these channels in the contemporary natural flow regime. So that's sort of loaded. But the important words here are, you know, could plausibly, uh, which is a nod to it doesn't necessarily mean it is um, currently, uh, because in a lot of our systems, current conditions are preventing uh, these rivers from reaching those floodplains and, and, and oftentimes very deliberately. Uh, and then the contemporary natural flow regime, uh, well, in a lot of places, we've withdrawn a lot of water. Uh, we have a lot of manipulation of these water resources. And so we may not be dealing with a natural flow regime. All this translates to it's a bigger chunk of the landscape than we often um, assume when we just talk about a, a river channel and its floodplain. Uh, it's, we tend to undersell. And some riverscapes are really quite easy to read. Uh, they're sort of topographically, if you will, obvious. You know, on this 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 particular riverscape on the top here, uh, there's a big outwash terrace that's clearly not going to plausibly flood in the contemporary flow regime. Uh, maybe there's nice grade breaks between the uplands, the uh, the lowlands, and you know, and, and a healthy system. The the whole thing is uh, pretty obvious where the floodplain is sort of told by a mix of the riparian and the wetlands and uh, and where the channels are. So so that's that's fine. But others and uh, many many other riverscapes are harder to read because our footprints are all over them. Um, and sometimes the, the edges of them, where to find that valley bottom isn't, isn't quite so obvious, whether we're talking about, you know, what we might just think of as a roadside ditch, uh, but, you know, once was a stream, uh, its own riverscape, uh, versus, you know, mighty rivers that have been harnessed um, and uh, straightjacketed. We have a lot of riverscapes that look deceptively uh, good to most people. Uh, why do they look good? Because there's some green vegetation along them. No, oh, that must be, yeah, it must be just fine. But if you take a closer look, for example, at this riverscape, uh, this is a riverscape that is a product of a bulldozer. There was a big flood that came through, a river behaving like, you know, it should, arguably, and uh, the response was to run the bulldozer down put the channel in its place and put the spoils off to the side. And since then, this is recovered with vegetation. So it looks, you know, okay, but uh, it's a bowling alley. It's simplified. There's um, uh, very little habitat value here and it's certainly starved of structure like wood um, and uh, to a certain degree uh, sediment. And so, when we start talking a little later here about low tech process based restoration, our sort of underlying uh, hypothesis is one of structural starvation. And the time frame that I'm showing on this graph from Riemann et al., which is for the Columbia River Basin, will be very different in different parts of the US and different parts of, the, uh, of Europe. Uh, European timelines are going to extend way back in terms of our major impacts, um, but the sort of mix of resource extraction and land uses that uh, are these sort of assaults, if you will, on our riverscapes, many of them lead to starvation of some of our primary sources of structure, wood um, and beaver uh, most notably. There are lots of ways that we can look at the gloom and doom of uh, how bad things are. Um, and no matter how you know we sort of uh, sort of summarize that, the the scope of riverscape uh, degradation is is really difficult to overstate. Uh, it's it's absolutely massive, and and we realize this, and this is reflected in public spending uh, in many countries on on restoration efforts. But most of those efforts go to tiny postage stamp little projects. Uh, you know, if, if they start getting above a, a kilometer or a few kilometers, that's a big project. And, you know, price tags uh, here in France, you could easily spend upwards of a million euros on a kilometer. But that leaves, you know, literally millions of kilometers uh, in need neglected. Another part of our problem is ecological 
logical amnesia. Uh, we forgot what, you know, if you, if, if you will, sort of reference uh, conditions uh, were or what's possible. And in some cases, you know, here in Europe, it's really difficult when some of these riverscapes have got, you know, over 2,000 years of manipulation. Um, a, a lot of scientists, we thought that, uh, you know, you see this sort of thing with this beaver dam um, and this sort of structural forced multi-threaded flow. <laughs> Um, that you, we would think that this is an anomaly. And what we've been learning slowly and stubbornly is that these weren't anomalies. These were pervasive uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, ben Goldfarb does a nice job of describing this in his book, Eager. There's, there's lots of different uh, syntheses and conceptualizations of this, as well as empirical data being published in the scientific literature in the past 15 years. Uh, and, you know, we throw jargon at it, stage zero, eight, anastomosing, but, but, but ways of talking about how important structural forcing was. If you want to hear more about that, um, a bunch of the free modules that we have on the website, uh, there's, there's recordings and lectures that you can listen to. So Mark Beardsley has a really nice way of describing what's possible, reimagining riverscapes, and he uses actually this analogy of, of, of soup, uh, which is kind of fun. So let's, uh, let's dive into a riverscape health analogy and uh, let's uh, try and synthesize some of what's coming out of the literature with three simple principles. The riverscape health analogy builds off of, you know, health analogies have been used for rivers for, you know, at least 30 to 40 years. And we can ask ourselves, what's a healthy diet for a riverscape? And if you ponder that for a minute, I mean, water should come to mind, right? So natural flow regime. There's a lot of geomorphologists probably on the call, so sediment, uh, but also other things from life, organic matter, wood, uh, beaver dams, etc. And different rivers have different metabolisms, a different ability to process uh, that diet, you know, at different rates. They, uh, they also exercise. What is the role of exercise in a riverscape? Well, it's really the geomorphic processes, uh, as well as life imprinted on top of that, that lead to turnover and new habitats and new geomorphic units, channel shifting, et cetera, accessing that riverscape. So if you think about the example of beaver and what they do, uh, they're dramatically uh, modifying the diet of, of a riverscape locally, right? They're bringing these terrestrial subsidies by dragging in, for example, Aspen off of hill slopes uh, down into to, to the channels. Um, and our premise, as we think about this health analogy uh, with regards to most restoration practices, is that too many of them are akin to just one part of medicine, and that is you know, invasive surgery. Uh, we do, you know, reconstructive surgery, you go in and uh, I'm going to fix it. And uh, one of the things that we forget, we may put a cast on if someone breaks a bone, uh, but we're usually putting those casts back in rivers in the form of riprap uh, or, you know, stabilization. And we're over-focusing on control and not focusing on the sort of healing and the exercise that that system might need to do. Uh, and so, what we're trying to do with low tech process based restoration is think of our actions more akin to you know preparing a, a healthy meal that might provide some nourishment um, that that system can digest uh, our ultimate goal is not to be in the business of feeding meals uh, to these systems but to coexist with them in a way that uh, they could feed themselves so We've taken um, sort of a lot of ideas that are in the literature and sort of boiled it down to three things. Riverscapes need space, healthy riverscapes that is. Structure forces complexity and that builds resilience. And the opposite of how we've managed most of our rivers, um, that is for uh, efficient conveyance of water is actually a good thing. And the idea is that if these principles are realized, we should be supporting greater rates of biodiversity. Uh, we should be self-sustaining this natural infrastructure, this, this part of the landscape. 
um, and allowing easier coexistence and adaptation to, for example, uh, the climate crisis uh, along and within these riverscapes. And our sort of get out of jail free card on, on this is what sort of uh, transcends these different principles is this idea of, well, how important are these different things in a specific riverscape, say a gorge versus a big, you know, braided river? Uh, well, it depends. And it depends are our favorite two words in the natural sciences. And they are uh, very much overused. <laughs> so uh, this is why you go get a degree in ecology or geomorphology or whatnot, so that you can articulate what it depends on and why there's differences in, say, a gorge, you know, versus a big meandering uh, system. Uh, if we elaborate on those just a tiny bit, streams need space. They need this space to sort of adjust, to exercise. And if we can read and interpret valley bottoms, um, we have a good hint as to how much space they needed in the past uh, to do this. And this idea is not at all new. Here in France, um, Hervé Piguet, one of my hosts um, and collaborators, has been pushing this idea of an erodible river corridor, which uh, has been taken up uh, here in practice um, in, a, in, a, in a big way. And this is communicated in different countries in different ways, right? Space for the river, freedom space, natural flood management, fluvial hazard zones, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of, of ways to get at this. Uh, Another way of thinking about it uh, is, you know, we could probably get away with taking some kids uh, in a classroom and just locking them in that classroom and sitting them in their seats and they're just gonna work all day, no recess. And we might get away with that for a while, but at some point that is gonna boil over and backfire in a very miserable way for that teacher. Uh, this is sort of what we've done, uh, in my opinion, with too many riverscapes. Uh, we haven't provided the playground. Um, and it isn't just, you know, well, giving them some place to exercise and run around and play means that you're going to let them, you know, leave campus and go, you know, anywhere. Uh, we can constrain that. The playground is the valley bottom, right? This is the, the, the place in which we can expect, you know, some screaming and yelling and some tears and some, you know, laughs of joy or whatever. And so these simple sorts of ways of sort of uh, conveying uh, the, the, the concepts that we, we sort of muddy up and fancy up with a lot of jargon in the literature, uh, some scientists will hate this. Um, I don't care. I'm not talking to uh, scientists for this. This is uh, some ideas about how we distill what we're trying to get at and communicate with broader audiences. Um, the second principle is structure forces complexity and that builds resilience. And there's a lot to unpack in this, but let's just do it a piece at a time. So uh, in these illustrations that Macy Richards has done for us uh, here, she's emphasizing the structure like uh, woody debris jams or beaver dams and say a wet meadow system, it could be, you know, rhizominous root mats. Uh, that structure basically makes things more complex. It starts with changing the hydraulics. Fancy way of saying it makes things deeper uh, or shallower, faster or slower, right? Those changes in the hydraulics from something uniform and monotonous to something diverse and, and even something that sounds interesting actually amplifies and modulates geomorphic processes. Things like the erosion, deposition, transport, and the storage of sediment. And that leaves in its wake these much more complex geomorphic units, which are much more interesting habitat. The other thing that happens when we have structural forcing, particularly when so much of it is by uh, organic matter, life, things that are actually alive, not just sediment, these become much more resilient deposits. Um, you know, if I give you a garden hose and a, and, a, and a sandbox, fill it with sand, and you start spraying that uh, garden hose all over the sandbox, that is a very vulnerable deposit. Uh, however, if we built that sandbox up with uh, some sand, but also, I don't know, some leaf litter, some mosses, uh, or, you know, some, some sticks, some organic matter, right? Now you're mixing together a whole bunch of stuff of a whole bunch of different sizes and life is taking hold. 
things will grow in that. And this becomes this rich carbon fiber matrix that's a much more resilient uh, way to rebuild a valley bottom than, uh, than just with uh, sediment alone. So it turns out resilience, something that most of us sort of strive towards, uh, it's the capacity to recover quickly from disturbance. And the disturbances that we can find a lot of common ground with a lot of people that we're afraid of and are exacerbated by climate change, things like, like fire, things like floods, things like droughts. Well, those are natural processes that have been exacerbated. But if we have healthier riverscapes, we, uh, we can weather those, those, those sorts of events much better. Uh, in this picture, Macy's trying to show uh, that, you know, that here's a fire, but this fire took place. That's a, a natural process. And it even produced this, you know, big debris flow and landslide, but the infrastructure survived. The natural infrastructure of this riverscape is still there. So sometimes it's healthy or something is helpful, I apologize, when we're talking to different groups where we don't have to be so specific about what it is that they care about that, you know, you, they want to be resilient. Some of us might be coming at it from trying to save fish populations or just a healthy riverscape in general. But for others, it might just be, you know, I'd like my home to still survive as these floods and fires and droughts, you know, uh, persist. Here's an example that's fairly obvious. This is a landscape that had a, had a major fire and the vast majority of it, the riparian area, burnt to the ground. It was not resilient. This is a complicated concept right here. Uh, water does not burn, right? That's uh, what happened is we had structural forcing by beaver. They built these dams, they wetted up the valley bottom sponge, and you had this refugia during the, the, the fire for wildlife, for livestock. And then you have this much more resilient, uh, preserved uh, habitat, if you will, post-fire to weather the post-fire runoff and the sediment and ash and debris flows. That's a big deal. Our third principle is the inefficient conveyance of water is healthy. And uh, what we mean by that is not that everything should be inefficient. The extreme of this would be a reservoir. What we really mean is that stuff is, oops, I apologize. Stuff is varied. And so uh, by stuff, I mean the movement of mass through the system, water, sediment, nutrients, wood, et cetera. So there's places where some of it can move quite quickly and have rather short residence times. But there's other places where uh, often from structural forcing, we get engagement even at low flows out onto uh, floodplain surfaces, into side channels, uh, into uh, beaver ponds, et cetera that really slow the flow and in, in some of these cases, uh, slow it extremely through infiltration into uh, groundwater and we get these, these much, much longer residence times and keep that sponge uh, uh, saturated. A way of quantifying this really simply is just to look at the inundated extent of water. And what we're looking at here in the right-hand side, this, this uh, little riverscape, you can clearly see uh, has been dammed up by some beaver. Um, the lower left is basically a map of that. The upper uh, left is a map of that same riverscape a few years before beaver had come back and built their dams there. And these two maps are at the exact same discharge, low flow, base flow. And the map on the top, only 5% of the valley bottom is inundated. On the map on the bottom, 20%. This is crazy. We, we, we refer to this as the water magic trick because there's not any more water through time. The same exact discharge coming in and trickling out at the bottom um, is, is what we see between both of these, these uh, events. It's just that in this one, the structural forcing has diversified the flow field so much. We've got this inefficiency uh, that we literally do have more aquatic habitat, but without any more flow. And that's pretty remarkable. It turns out this is remarkably consistent too across hugely diverse uh, riverscapes and physiographic settings. So one of the ways we can kind of reinforce recognizing what healthy looks like is to kind of uh, also uh, look at what unhealthy is by comparing these things. So if we kind of work backwards, uh, this is how we've managed many of our riverscapes for efficient conveyance, right? Drainage, 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 let it pass. 
Uh, the best example I can think of is the Los Angeles River. Isn't this beautiful? A very easy thing to calculate discharge in. Another example from Germany, but uh, we, all, we all have rivers like this. Um, over here, this is uh, what will give most hydraulic engineers a heart attack if you ask them to quantify it. Uh, but this is a beaver infested mess, right? This is beaver dam complexes, um, slowing the flow, making it inefficient. Certainly not winning the race, but maybe uh, winning the fitness battle. Structure forces complexity and builds resilience. We get these structurally rich and resilient systems versus these systems that we rip all the structure out because we're concerned it's going to plug up a bridge or a culvert. And ironically and paradoxically, we actually make these structurally starved systems more vulnerable uh, to disturbance. Uh, and, you know, obviously uh, what we do in most of our riverscapes is we uh, have diverted them, pollute them, encroach them. Now it's tempting to conclude from this that the only way you can get healthy is, you know, to come back to some sort of utopian, you know, it's all or nothing. And that's nonsense. There's a lot of incremental things that we can do to make small claims back and have healthier riverscapes. It's not like, you know, the difference between me as a couch potato or, you know, some Olympic athlete that I'll never be, uh, you know, I have to choose between those two. Something in between those and tending towards and aspiring towards the Olympic athlete uh, is what we're talking about. So what's low tech process-based restoration? It's not new. There's a lot of different techniques uh, that have been around for uh, a long time uh, that we've uh, discovered, forgotten, you know, uh, rediscovered, reinvented, et cetera. This includes things, uh, make sure to mute yourself if you're just joining. Uh, this includes things like, you know, rock uh, sort of erosion control structures, uh, lots of methods of getting wood in the systems, simple things like just, uh, just intensive grazing management uh, to uh, actually keep keep livestock moving, um, not necessarily excluding them, but uh, just keep them moving to allow vegetation to recover. So these things are not a new idea, like I mentioned. And in fact, here in France, just down in the, in, in the Drome, there's wonderful examples from the 1870s to the 1890s of afforestation, uh, replanting lots of uh, Austrian pine, uh, but then also these low tech structures put in uh, what had turned into gullies and stuff from these, these, these hill slopes unraveling in the wake of uh, intensive uh, uh, subsistence agriculture uh, on the hill slopes. So there's lots of different ways to go about this. Uh, and one of the fun things, if you lean into that analogy is the meal preparers um, can be a lot more diverse than just somebody who, is qualified to run a piece of heavy equipment. Um, so the P in process-based restoration, um, those few of you tuning in from the States will recognize Paps Blue Ribbon. Um, those of you from Europe, if you've visited the States, uh, I hope this isn't the only beer you've sampled, but uh, it is sort of known as blue collar beer, but truth be told, it's more of a hipster beer. Uh, but, uh, this is not Paps Blue Ribbon, this is process-based restoration, an idea, a concept that's been around for some time. And we're talking about uh, some low-tech flavors of it. We've tried to distill this into a uh, standard of practice in this design manual, which is free on the that website and pocket guides uh, that uh, Try to try to kind of uh, communicate the basics, and then provide agencies and re regulatory um, bodies with some standards that people can purport that they are following. What our sort of contribution to this space was um, was a few additional low tech structures to add to that sort of cookbook, if you will. And uh, mainly, we were focused on some structures that promote the process of wood accumulation and structures that promote the process of beaver dam activity. Uh, the confusion people have, uh, and we've seen this a lot in the US where they just hear the low tech part and they get really excited about these structures. And people that are used to building structures tend to build them to last. We're not necessarily building these to last. We're building them to invoke process. So one way I could do that is maybe this little woody structure here, this post-assisted log structure, gets a bunch of wood accumulating on it. 
But success could also be that this thing blows out in a flood and reaccumulates on the next structure downstream and makes a far better jam than I could have built. Uh, similarly, beaver always do a better job than we do. Uh, so in these standards of practice, we have typical construction details, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and everything has these little Creative Commons licenses on it so that people can take them, use them, adapt them um, at will. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, Steve Bennett's going to be giving a webinar on June 12th uh, through IS Rivers here. Um, uh, but also there's a couple of modules, one from Steve on PALS, another one from Scott on BDAs, if, if you're interested. And there's a huge diversity of different groups uh, doing wonderful work uh, embracing this, uh, everything from tribes in the nonprofit sector to uh, federal and state agencies. So what does this look like? A few examples. Well, the one that kind of got low-tech process-based restoration, you know, some attention was Bridge Creek. This is in central Oregon. And the driver here was not that this was an incised stream, but it was trying to fix the incised stream to the benefit of an endangered uh, species, uh, a steelhead salmon population. And beaver were uh, present in this system. And because of improvements in grazing management, there was this modest little band of riparian green groceries, vegetation along here, enough for them to build with. But when you build a dam down in a deep trench at high flows, all the pressure of the water is acting on that dam. And they often fail. And they tend to fail by end cutting. And that end cutting is bank erosion. And it's a good thing if it's not threatening a road, right? It's a good thing because it widens this trench. It creates more space that instead of trying to get up onto some old surface, you're rebuilding new surfaces, new floodplains uh, in this wider space. And you're sourcing material to do it. And it makes it easier for beaver to come back and build something that lasts uh, a little longer, those eventually also breach, also can fail. But over time, these become more and more resilient and you get to this sort of stage zero anastomosing mess, if you will. So we had some examples of this, but the timescales take way too long. Uh, and so we know beaver are opportunistic and we asked the question, could we mimic what they do and maybe speed it up? Or could we promote them to speed it up uh, by giving them uh, some, some little bit more stable structures, uh, not permanent structures, but things that wouldn't blow out in every flood. Uh, and so this was sort of published and that's all great. And you know, a few restoration practitioners get excited, but the reason it actually got attention and credibility was this. It's because we were able to show a population level response to this endangered um, uh, species of steelhead. And uh, that response was by, you know, some painstaking monitoring that cost orders of magnitude more than the restoration uh, to track changes in the density um, of these fish, their growth, their survival, and the product of those is production. And compared to a control population, uh, we were able to untangle this uh, very pronounced response, which is uh, what really gave this credibility. Nick Bowes does a much better job of talking about that um, in module 2C, if you're interested. Um, and a similar thing on the wood side, Steve talks about in module 2D. So what does it look like when you pursue these things? Well, it starts with building a shared vision. This is an example from Upper Deschutes Watershed Council um, and uh, the, the land trust there, uh, where they had picked up this riverscape that had previously been relegated uh, to the channel pushed off to one side to drain this so it could be used for grazing. But the land trust picked this up and this was something that could now be in play. And it was already trying to pull itself off of that uh, valley left wall. And so we came up with a vision for, you know, getting this back to this, you know, system where structural forcing was a really important uh, part of the, of, of the dynamic. And, the expectation management that this isn't necessarily with low tech anyway, going to be instant. There's other ways where you might be able to get there right away, but this is a more incremental um, approach. And so 
uh, you know, the idea is in red dots there, you put a bunch of, of structure in and you're trying to kickstart some of these processes that are already in some places happening, you're accentuating them and in other places they're not. And so you're encouraging them. So, you know, you put a bunch of structures in, uh, you watch it grow, you're waiting for your foots to do, to, to do some work. You're waiting for beaver maybe to show up. Uh, and then you come in and you provide a little bit of a top up, right? To keep pushing it along towards its recovery potential. Uh, and, and the timing of this isn't precise. You're, you're, you're waiting for floods. You might get lucky, uh, it might, it, you might hit a drought for five years. Uh, and so this is an example uh, here. I'll speed it up because it's a little boring of that same project. Uh, this isn't a huge uh, project, this is a demonstration. It's only about a mile uh, or a little less than two kilometers. So this is, uh, you can see the wood in here, right? A bunch of uh, woody structures primarily. There are a few little beaver dam analogs out on some dry floodplain surfaces if we get engagement. But just a lot of wood, basically going from a system that had like three jams in it to a system that now has like 150. And uh, also places where we're really trying to attack the floodplain there, okay? So that's, uh, that's a treatment, that's a meal, that's an offering. This is uh, three or four months later, not a massive flood, um, but let's call it a typical flood, one that, uh, you know, there would be fear, oh, all this, you know, wood, this loose wood you've put in, it's all going to float away, it's all going to cause a problem. Well, I don't know how good your memory is, but uh, not a lot of this is washing away um, in these in these flows. Um, a lot of it is accumulating a lot of sediment, um, some wood, and uh, we're getting more purchase with the floodplain than we would have at this flow otherwise, and we're getting more diversity of in-channel habitat. And as we work our way down here, uh, we're starting to really eat away at some of these banks and rebuild uh, new floodplain surfaces through lateral activity. And this is, this is uh, kind of what some of these things can look like. So it's important that we focus on some key processes. And to emphasize this, I'm not gonna focus. I'm gonna do what we do as reductionist scientists. Uh, let's talk about process-based restoration, right? The verbs, the processes, um, and then the nouns and the adjectives. So let's talk about hydrologic processes first, right? It starts with the water. So things like flooding floodplains, attenuating flood uh, flows, augmenting base flow. And let's think about the hydraulics. Uh, we got to slow or deepen, speed up, shunt, split, back up water. Uh, then we have a... Uh, we also have geomorphic processes, things like building up, cutting down, transporting, and storing uh, sediment. And finally, biologic life, right? Growth, survival, reproduction, death. Uh, so I hope this puts you to sleep at this late hour of the day. Uh, I hope that you look at this and are somewhat overwhelmed. I was. Uh, because we started in order working through these things, right? Process-based restoration. Um, it's, uh, you know, all I need to know is know a little bit about all these things, and then I can design and optimize for the first perfect project, right? Well, Janine Castro and Colin Thorne published an interesting paper uh, recently talking about this stream evolution triangle and pointing out that we've spent way too much time assuming and emphasizing just the sort of hydrogeomorphic sides of, of, of systems or systems in which uh, those are the, the processes that dominate. But so many more systems, especially in their healthy state, are ones in which life is what really dominates. And if you want to compare, for example, stream power to the energy uh, on the biotic side, the biotic side dwarfs uh, the energy and also is incredibly uh, powerful at dissipating that energy. So you can just sort of set that aside into, you know, semesters and semesters of, uh, of, of, of painful coursework. Uh, but in ecology, the, we, we often focus on keystone species because if they are doing okay, they're kind of an indicator or a bellwether that most of the other parts of that ecosystem are probably doing okay. 
And we can use that same idea with these processes and focus on key processes. And the key processes in process space or low tech process space restoration, at least, are wood accumulation and beaver dam activity, maybe in wet meadow systems or zonus root mat production. So there's a PAL buried underneath this. There's a post assisted log structure. You can't see it because so much wood accumulated in this flood on top of it. That's the success, not whether or not there's this structure I can't even see anymore uh, underneath it. The structure was the meal. That's our action, right? Um, it isn't the solution. And uh, I was out in the field the other day with uh, Baptiste uh, Morzot here in France, and he has some wonderful books, one of them, Rekindling Life, and really talking about the importance that life plays somewhat obviously right in recovering some of these systems and how much we sort of fight it and we sort of forget about it and he asked me well are there any key processes that don't involve life and i can't think of any um there's important processes but not ones that i would elevate in healthy riverscapes uh, that don't involve life uh, if you want that go to mars um, if you want to learn more about beaver um, Ben Goldfarb's book's wonderful. He has a short little uh, lecture in Module 1K. Nick Bowis talks uh, more about some of the beaver behavior and uh, their, their beaver dam activity. Uh, and that might be of interest to some of you. So let's uh, transition to wrapping up here. So what we do. Um, I think it's helpful to have some sideboards that sort of guide our actions much more than I mean, recipes are helpful to get us started, but the sort of sideboards, the principles kind of keep us on track. And so these are what we've come up with for low tech process-based restoration. And it definitely applies to, some of them apply to other forms of restoration. Um, maybe not, it's okay to be messy um, to all, but uh, there's strength in numbers, use natural building materials, let the system do the work and uh, defer decision-making to the system. And our ultimate goal is self-sustaining systems. So when we first started, we were, you know, we, you know, if you're gonna put untreated wooden fence posts in, like, well, yeah, you want them perfectly plumb, like you'd put in a fence. Well, like in this example, you'd put these, you know, logs in and put these little posts to sort of anchor them. Well, wood floats, and so in high flows, this stuff floated out and moved on downstream. And we quickly realized the more cluttered, variable, the Velcro, and then putting the posts so that they crossed over each other to sort of keep things from floating away and wedging these things in, that messiness, it, you take inspiration from natural examples, and it's absolutely okay. I know your mom told you to always make your bed, but uh, beavers like to make messes. And so can you, um, it's that messiness which really drives uh, so many of, 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 of the wonderful sort of ecosystem services that we're after. The other is stolen from the Golden State Warriors. They didn't finish out this season like we would we'd hope with another championship, at least uh, some of us, but uh, strength in numbers. Uh, this is a picture or a, or a map rather of a small portion of a much larger project uh, this is spanning, you know, a little over uh, four kilometers here, and every single little dot there, every single little symbol, that's a different structure. Uh, we have had such a deficit, such a legacy of structural starvation. We need to get a lot of material back into some of these systems, um, and uh, and sometimes it can look pretty crazy, like what I'm showing you here. Uh, I'm not going to show this whole video, but I'm going to show enough of it to convince you that it's boring. I love boring videos because uh, it means we're hitting these systems uh, with enough numbers, with, a, with enough scale. This was a drone video, someone that took a workshop from us back in like 2018. They went away a year or two later and then someone, someone sent me this link and it was like, oh, wow, look what, they, look what these guys up at BLM have been doing. And they built all these structures and they're turning what was sagebrush covered floodplains back into real floodplains, functional floodplains, and not even at that big of a flow here. And so you're seeing lots and lots of structures um, getting that purchase, getting multiple channels, getting all sorts of, of, of wonderful things happening. So these are solutions that can scale up to the scope of the problem. And some people will argue, well, yeah, that's great, but you can't do these in big rivers. And I only work in big rivers. Those are the important ones. Well, 
I won't argue that they're important, but they do only constitute, you know, something like, you know, five to 10% of the drainage network. Most of the drainage network is locked up in smaller things, sometimes uninspiring in their current form, but uh, also a lot more tractable for really hitting some big miles. And they're incredibly important because they feed those big proud rivers. Uh, another part of strength in numbers is building the workforce. Um, we're really committed to teaching professionals, to teaching next generation of professionals in this uh, uh, stuff. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun because so many different people can get involved. In France, uh, this is probably less important. Uh, use natural building materials. Well, yeah, of course you would. Uh, in the U.S., where we have such a bad habit of making lousy food uh, fortified with uh, so many preservatives, God knows how long it'll last in you. Um, but uh, this uh, this is uh, maybe resonates a little more. But uh, local building materials, uh, locally sourced um, materials, and really sort of a foodie mentality to uh, have local adaptations, regional variation in the recipes. Um, getting very creative and a lot of pride, um, I think, are some of the exciting aspects of this, this, this sort of work. Let the system do the work. This is stolen from Bill Zedeik. Let the water do the work. Um, so geomorphic work, like erosion and deposition, instead of getting out grading. I love this quote from Jared McKee. What if restoration was about stream power doing the work, not diesel power? But there's more to the system uh, than just geomorphic work. There's life, right? There's what vegetation does. There's what beaver do. There's what spawning salmon do. We can defer some of the decisions if we have a big enough playground and can provide expectation management about, yeah, there could be some chaos in that playground, but it's not gonna be outside of, of, of that playground. Um, then we can, we don't have to take on the liability associated with, you know, deciding everything, deciding where, how, when, what height do I grade the floodplain to? Let the flood decide. How far do I uh, cut this bank? Let the river decide. Uh, these are things that uh, we need to practice a little bit of humility, but they are very, very powerful when we can hand these things over um, to life. And finally, we don't want to be in the business of feeding these meals forever. We want to be in the business of getting the system to a place where it can feed itself. Um, and so what's our exit strategy on this trajectory of mimicking, promoting, and sustaining process? Uh, this is an example uh, where Beaver translocated. Um, and and how they sort of quickly took over and got to a self-sustaining state. You know, 25 BDAs over a half a kilometer. Beaver came in and uh, they were extirpated from the systems. So we built these beaver dam analogs to release them into, and now they've built nearly 250 additional ones and maintained all but two of what we built. And they've spread out to more than five kilometers. Those are the sorts of multiplier effects that we need to see out of our uh, our efforts. And you know, my good friend Jay Wild tells this story um, of that last slide way better than I do. And I take him all over to different workshops and have him tell this story and, and it resonates. It's, it's really powerful. Um, and I think this is how we can get to these ultimate goals of, of self-sustaining systems. So I will leave you with, it's okay to do things you thought you weren't supposed to, like let life happen. We don't have to exercise so much control. Uh, there's partnerships. There's partnerships with the people. There's partnerships with these systems. Um, thinking of them as living systems, thinking specifically about the life within them is really helpful. I think having a shared vision of resiliency is helpful no matter where you are. Uh, in the American West, um, we've had a lot of traction with groups like Sage Grass Initiative, Working Land for Wildlife, lots of ranchers and farmers in this resiliency of re-wetting the valley bottom sponge, right? Um, I don't know what it's gonna be here. Um, maybe it's a shared vision of resiliency around free evolution, rekindling life, right? Uh, this is an example of BDAs, uh, I'll show you in a moment, uh, built at uh, this Grand Laval farm. Um, and thanks to uh, Baptiste uh, Morzat, who, oh no, 
my video is not going to show. Oh, well, it's basic. Oh, here it goes. This is so great. So this was a riverscape, believe it or not, relegated to culverts, tore the culverts out, giving part of the farm back to that riverscape. And just go back here for a second. Those are the kids who helped build these simple little BDAs along with you know 30 wonderful volunteers. And uh, they were testing this out minutes afterwards to make sure that uh, it was also good kid habitat uh, for play and swimming. Um, this place will be unrecognizable um, when life takes hold uh, in, in, in very short order and it will be a much more inspiring thing than the culvert it was. So I really like Michael Pollan's in defense of food and I think of process-based restoration sort of like uh, the carrot yeah, in, in defense of food. He describes nutrition science, um, a science that's very reductionist and thinks, well, if we can understand the building blocks of food, the ingredients, the nutrients, then we should be able to, you know, make an artificial version of that food. And, you know, the real reason for making artificial food is it's much more profitable than real food. But, you know, much to uh, scientists' um, confusion and disappointment, for some reason, that artificial food, the artificial carrot, isn't as good for us as the real carrot. And what Michael uh, concludes is uh, just eat the damn carrot. Who cares, right? Um, it's better for us. We don't need to know exactly why. Scientists will continue to strive on why. But from a management perspective, use the carrot. And there's an analogy uh, that uh, there that I think crosses over here into letting these systems do the work. And so I'll leave you with um, a reminder that you know some ideas of recognizing what healthy and unhealthy looks like, and some of those health principles, and some restoration principles that uh, kind of contextualize our actions and what we can do not to make it healthy, but let it and facilitate it getting back to healthy on its own. And we'll leave it there. There is uh, a lot of compatibility. Uh, there's often fear that wood and beaver dams, if they blow out, okay. will wash okay. downstream. But when you get these systems uh, up to the sort of uh, densities of, of, of wood, densities of dams that you would have had in them, uh, the stuff doesn't move as far. So it's actually providing um, some protection because the material is not necessarily washing down. It's more likely to hang up on Velcro. Okay. And it's also so providing flood attenuation. I completed because uh, in case of uh, white, with different uh, rivers, it's not the same. Trans. Yeah. So please go ahead. I I mean, yeah, we 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 can leave it there for for, for now. It's uh, yeah, it's I mean, also gets back to it depends, right? So it depends okay. on exactly where you are. There are places where uh, there's too many constraints and it doesn't make sense. But we've also done these sorts of projects in more urbanized areas, um, and it just requires a little more careful planning. Uh, I complete so. Um... We had a webinar last year with H2 Zolion about uh, wood uh, fixation uh, with uh, Bob Dubernick from uh, US Air Forest. There is all an um, engineering um, about and science about how to fix wood in the rivers. And so uh, we could uh, get you uh, uh, the link with this uh, video and also with the US Air Forest guide who include all this uh, possibility to be sure that wood can be stay in place at a certain level of risk. <laughs> and uh, the conclusion also about um, this last webinar it was by Bob Gubanik. At one step of level of uh, in in, uh, inundation, um, we have not only problem of food. <laughs> so I mean that um, uh, if maybe you could have some uh, wood uh, leave with big uh, flow, but uh, we'll, in this case, uh, the floor has already done a lot of problems again. So, uh, good question comes up a ton, especially from European audiences. Uh, you watch too much Hollywood and Netflix, um, and <laughs> I have too many pictures 
that are uh, misleading of these big, you know, wild open spaces. Yes, we have some. Most of them have more constraints and impacts than you might uh, realize. And if we actually systematically map um, our rural and our urban uh, landscapes, uh, we have a lot of the same constraints. Um, I, I need to update this tired old slide deck to show uh, more of those, but it's, uh, it's yeah, I, it, we, have, we have the exact same issues. In some ways, urban footprints, because we sprawl so much bigger, are more of a problem uh, than, than here where the, the cities are more compact. Um, and when we get into rural landscapes, we're, we're dealing with the same sorts of stuff. Sure, sometimes uh, they can, uh, just like natural debris jams and natural beaver dams under certain flow conditions can sometimes cause problems. Just like when I get on the road and drive my car, um, cars sometimes prevent me from getting to my destination, other cars. So I think we should get rid of all cars because you know I'm not able to get to my destination. Um, I'm, I'm being preposterous. So. Uh, we've monitored uh, lots of fish. So, for example, in the in the Bridge Creek study, we had over 100,000 pit tagged fish, uh, where we and a bunch of antennas as well as mobile surveys, uh, and we actually saw fish moving uh, at you know different life stages and moving more regularly, even on a daily basis, upstream and downstream um, of some of these dams. Uh, so. Uh, if we saw adult spawners able to get through. A lot of fish are migrating through these systems when uh, there's higher flows. And so then there's these little overflow side channels and fish ladders. Uh, and, and we have you know, various studies that uh, different groups are publishing, um, starting to look at uh, fish movement data. And uh, you know, yes, you can have these things act as temporary barriers, but that's not always a bad thing. Uh, and uh, the more that we actually look at the data instead of just working off of old assumptions, um, the more we realize that uh, the benefits uh, far outweigh um, those temporary um, impediments to moving around. I, I just compared to say that uh, before we were uh, on the earth, there were a lot of fish and uh, beavers, and it was working without us. So if, if the question about stage zero is referring to geomorphic grade line, um, we've got uh, actually Matthias uh, Pearl, he's on the, the, the line, uh, that project that I showed, uh, the low tech video from, they've done a bunch of geomorphic grade line. And the short answer is no, it's, uh, you see incredible uh, recruitment of, of, of vegetation and also, there's a misconception that the geomorphic grade line projects remove all of the living material and reset the elevation, and they don't. They, they remove the high surfaces, they leave some of what uh, they can, and then they bring in so much wood uh, and you get, you get recruitment um, you know, within months of, of these things. So I just completed to say that it will be something like a moving system and we will have some patch uh, going from a uh, youth uh, riparian, old riparian, it would move. So it's just messy, it's messy. Yeah, maybe not all at once. Um, maybe uh, incrementally, we don't need to uh, necessarily go in and reclaim the entire riverscape. It can be a little bit of a piece at a time and we can see how things go. Uh, also, there's a lot more, it's, well, it's politically much easier the day after a major catastrophic flood where everybody is thinking of rebuilding in the same stupid place to propose doing something different and rebuilding that infrastructure either elsewhere or in a way that can allow some of uh, these floods to pass um, better. So, uh, so I think, um, yeah, incrementally, but then also opportunistically with 
when floods happen, um, don't just give in to, yeah, we got to rebuild it exactly like it was. It was built wrong. I just completed your answer uh, because to say that um, the next um, the connective problem we had is that about uh, the question of um, uh, the earth uh, owner, uh, the landowners, the private landowners, uh, they will uh, be afraid to lose uh, capacity to um, use the earth to uh, grain uh, plants or whatever. So um, we we have to um, have a policy to um, make this uh, larger rivers possible. Yeah. Uh, and I told about uh, the Switzerland uh, example that they create um, uh, river space uh, limits uh, for the small rivers, five meters at least uh, in each um, par uh, part of the river. Uh, and uh, in this space, you can't do what you want, but there is a grant uh, to uh, compensate the loss of exploitation. So uh, we need to uh, uh, go to go further and to be more ambitious to create these tools that we don't have already. So the yep. Switzerland example is quite a good uh, idea to to um, maybe uh, uh, think about it. Yep. Uh, with uh, with big. Uh, boats like real navigation moving commerce or with like kayaks yes no real <laughs> boats no um i think that there are some limited opportunities for this sort of stuff on big navigable rivers on uh on on side channels and on floodplain systems uh where Especially some of these systems, if if they have a little bit of room, and you can still have your main shipping channel, and then you can have uh, side channels, and you see this with you know natural beaver dam activity. But uh, no, uh, we've avoided uh, those for rather obvious reasons. Um, I will say beaver dams are pretty fun to kayak over in high flow. Um, wood jams, I not so fond of uh, <laughs> in a kayak, but we. Uh, uh, there, there are some really, um, so Natalie uh, Kramer Anderson um, and colleagues have come up with some a pretty nice sort of risk assessment. And you know, if you if you map out where the recreational, you know, sort of boating uh, opportunities are, uh, you can definitely avoid uh, unnecessary high risk situations. To complete that, so we had a, a testimony from a river. Uh, Rick Vertorstadt, it's uh, a Netherlands uh, uh, state uh, company uh, that's taking care about uh, already about uh, um, boating uh, of uh, big boats uh, and also about um, uh, recreate uh, natural uh, environment. And they use uh, wood in the uh, Rhine River and uh, some also uh, big rivers. Uh, in side channels, uh, but not only side channels, also in the um, rivers that are with the boats, but not on the way of the boats, uh, but on the side uh, board. And uh, but they wanted to be sure, so they they use uh, concrete to load uh, the the wood uh, on the, the river. Uh, but uh, we can discuss about uh, this uh, possibility and use concrete, okay? But anyway, they had results because. Uh, uh, they have seen that uh, coming back some uh, fish species that disappeared. But in fact, they were not disappeared, that the habitats which were not there. And when they recreate wood habitats, the fish were coming back and they had a lot of fish. So it, um, uh, we can show that it's useful also in big rivers. Uh, yeah. That That's, yeah, wood and habitat structures. Um, but you know they're going to be more engineered, less le less low tech, and you know you're probably going to be installing those things from a barge as opposed to uh, you know you're not waiting uh, in, in the river. So so yeah, good good point from the previous seminar uh, that that's uh, really viable. Uh, there's a bunch of bunch of methods, um, but uh, the low tech is 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 less applicable in those those such settings.
Great question. It's confusing. The messaging is confusing because on the one hand, we talk about removing man-made structures like weirs, uh, because they are a migration and passage barrier. Uh, answering the last question first, should we abandon these uh, destruction of these weirs and re removal of some of these weirs? I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of benefit to uh, removal of unnecessary dams, removal of unnecessary weirs. Um, fish passage um, and migration in those sorts of situations, even with fish ladders, is, is, is really, really difficult. So those, those projects do make sense. Uh, I just completely to say that um, uh, if we add the uh, efficiency uh, study about uh, fish passages, we can constate that um, uh, there is difficult to, to build uh, efficiency field uh, fish passage because uh, life is not easy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, uh, when uh, we see that uh, these fish passages are not really uh, well cared by the people, there is wood inside, it's not working. And also when you uh, accumulate, uh, by example, 10 fish passages, um, you can see that it will not be able for the fish to go uh, uh, along all these 10 passages to the end so easily. So uh, there is, uh, at least if uh, there is uh, 100 fishes at the beginning, at the end, there is not so much, maybe 10, one, uh, I don't know, but really it's uh, not uh, so easy. Yeah, so the, the, they're, they do seem conceptually similar, but they're very different. Um, these man-made structures are built to last and they're built often with very uniform uh, hydraulics that, you know, if you're kayaking in these things, they're scary. They're like death traps, you know, to, to, to go over. Uh, whereas, um, you know, natural beaver dams and uh, temporary beaver dam analogs, uh, they don't last forever. They're ephemeral. They come and they go. So even if it is a barrier for a while, it's rare that that's a barrier for uh, forever. Uh, and they just have much more diverse ways for fish to move through uh, around, up and over, um, much better than an engineered fish ladder. Uh, so they're, uh, they're ephemeral and they're much more complex. And in that complexity gives lots of little resting spots and it's easier for fish to, you know, make their way through lots of little, uh, little pieces, for example, on the mattress of a beaver dam, uh, than, uh, than it would be on, you know, a big, you know, drop weir structure. So I just completed to say that um, anyways, uh, if we can uh, say that all the dams have an effect on the level of the water, it's not the same on the capacity of for fish to go ahead or down. Did you, I, I couldn't tell, did you mention this discussion we've been having about, uh, you know, I, I mean, Beaver dam has been an unfortunate word uh, and beaver dam analog, maybe an even more unfortunate term um, in, in, in English uh, mm. because of the connotations with dam. And uh, did you mention the conversations yeah. about instead of barrage, you know, maybe talking about mm. caster works or, you know, uh, travel, mm. I mean, like it's, okay. it, there's an opportunity in the translation to maybe not make some of the same hangups yeah. uh, that, that we've had. We had uh, some difficulty to choose the terms for translation to keep some difference between between some concepts which should be uh, uh, simplified to the same like they are, but they are not you want to comment on that <laughs> I mean, some you of can, us. You can give us uh, your uh, <laughs> approach in USA because uh, in France, I uh, would say that uh, exactly uh, as we explained, we uh, we are used to starve system, and when we can, we have to introduce it again. It's such a shock. Uh, I mean, uh, to to keep in mind that uh, it should be like that. And how to convince? How do you do in USA? Um. Yeah. Well. Uh... We have similar sorts of things where people, uh, often the regulatory bodies, it's habit, right? This is what we always require on this sort of project, um, and so we have to we have to work with them closely to 
uh, explain why some of those things may not be necessary or may not be that helpful and uh, see if you can get at the spirit of why they're requiring those models um, and answer the questions in more uh, pragmatic and simple ways. It starts though working in the areas where you know people are comfortable to give it a try, have a pilot, uh, and then you know if things start getting traction, uh, then we you know end up having to work at a higher level in these government agencies to you know to bring about changes, right? Um, and it, it it can be done. It just takes time. It takes patience. Um, Okay. I, I do want to comment on actually, at least in the Rhone, you know, uh, the, the the water authorities are uh, actually really interested in this. And uh, the 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 little video I showed at the very end um, that is with them in full partnership, um, finding a way to streamline requirements. So thank you very much to Joe and uh, to you, everything to that he, he gave to the H two Lyon community and to the French. Uh, community. So thank you very much, Joe, for this year and uh, for the presentation of today. We are we are really happy to work with you. Okay, I forget one Merci thing. Cool. Uh, is that uh, to say that uh, maybe at the end of the year, or next year, we will do another um, webinar with Joe about uh, your work. Joe, could you say just two words about your, your work? Uh, uh, you told us about uh, your, your tools. Two words, Veriscape Consortium. Uh, yeah, yeah. T tools and models that support the expectation management mm -hmm. behind this. What, what I've actually been doing on my sabbatical here with you all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But so, uh, uh, merci beaucoup for everything. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Et donc pour...